Okay, uh, so a couple quick things before we begin. Um, your reading for next time is actually not going to be an argumentative essay. Um, we're going to be looking at an excerpt from, a, from an ancient Greek play. Um, it's called the Eumenides. Uh, Eumenides is a Greek word that means kindly ones. And it's a euphemism for a group of goddesses who were called the Furies. Do any of you know who the Furies were in Greek and Roman mythology? I've never seen them on a movie. Okay. Maybe on Percy Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so, so what, what do you remember from the Percy Jackson movie? It was freaky. Okay. <laughs> it was like, um, I guess it, it was like part of the underworld, I think. And it was like mm -hmm. they had wings. It kind of made me fat almost. The other wings were. Yeah, so yeah, the Furies are un they're underworld goddesses. And their function is to punish evildoers. Right, so the Greek, uh, like, the Greek underworld is basically just like this kind of like dark, lightless place inside the earth where shades flit around forever, having completely forgotten their past existence, right? Everybody gets the same afterlife, whether you were good or bad. So what the Furies do is hound people who have committed horrible crimes while they're still alive on Earth. And this is you know, considered their light and their due, right? So <clears throat> to give you some context for what you're reading for next time, it's a it's at a point in the play where the wrongdoer the Furies are chasing has been acquitted of his crime or forgiven for his crime. And the Furies are complaining that they're not being given their rights. So the rhetorical situation is that the goddess Athena, who is the patron goddess of the city of Athens and is also the goddess of, does anybody know? She is a war goddess, yeah. But like, like war in terms of strategy and tactics, not in terms of like random bloodshed and violence. Yeah. Uh, what else? Does anybody else know what else Athena is the goddess of? Wisdom? Yeah, she's the goddess of wisdom. Good. <laughs> well, see, see, well, and, and that's the thing too. Like, if you're familiar with these Percy Jackson stories, right? You know, then you probably already know at least a little bit about Greek mythology. It's not always accurately represented, but still, you know, it's. It's in there. Um, so yeah, Athena is trying essentially to bargain with the Furies, right? To placate them for having taken their prey away from them. So that's the basic situation you're going to be looking at. And, yeah, and I am going to want you to look up and post words as usual. And I know that like this seems like a little, like you know probably a like busy work and a pain in the ass, right? But let me uh, explain to you why I have you do this. Um, in past semesters, when I asked the class what they thought of something they read, what do you think the most common response I got was? I didn't understand it. I didn't understand it, yeah. And when I try to get, you know, get across, like, okay, what did you not understand, right? They often had a hard time articulating that. So what I'm trying to ensure is that at least on the level of language, you understand what's going on. And that just by, you know, that just by giving you points for looking things up will encourage you to do that. So, right, that's it. Does anybody have any questions about anything? Everybody good? Great, all right, so. How'd the Aristotle go for you? What did you guys think? I thought I was going to start understanding what's going on. Okay. Yeah. So what, what was it about the end that helped you figure out what was going on? It just flowed better. Like, you yeah. had more interest in it, I guess. Okay. The sentences were better understood. Yeah, and I think, like, one thing we have to remember, too, is that, like, um, this is all translated from ancient Greek. And in order to you know, produce an anthology like this and not have a cost of fortune, they often use slightly outdated translations. Mm -hmm. right? So sometimes the language gets a little funky. Mm -hmm. like I didn't understand 
didn't start understanding it until it like was like chapter two and was uh -huh. talking about who does logos and pathos. Okay. And that's where I started. And was, and was that partly because that's something we've talked about before that was a little bit more familiar? You could kind of, okay, like, I know what this is? Yes. Okay. Did most, did, it, did everybody pretty much feel the same way about this, that the second part of this made a lot more sense yeah. than the first part? Okay. Um, so what I'd like to do then is try to set up a context for the whole thing that'll help us figure out what's going on in that first part that you had a little bit more trouble with, right? So in order to do this, let's review where we've been so far, right? So let's talk first about the viewpoints expressed by Gorgias and the Sophists, or at least Plato's version of Gorgias and the Sophists, and by Plato himself. And then we'll bring Aristotle into this. So what were the attitudes and beliefs of the sophists? They didn't believe in the absolute truth. Yep. No such thing as absolute truth. All we can do is create belief, right? And how did they think we, go, we went about creating belief or encouraging belief? Persuasion. Yeah, through persuasive speech, right? And in Gorgias's words, or at least Plato's words spoken through Gorgias, what does being able to speak persuasively get you? Yeah, basically whatever you want, right? Persuasive speech leads to personal power. The gorgeous does backtrack a little bit at the end of the. Uh, Tuesday's excerpt, right, and say, but, but you shouldn't use this for evil ends, right? <laughs> and what about Plato's position? What do, we, what do we remember about Plato's basic beliefs about reality first? Because that's at the center of everything. Plato believes that um, democracy is an issue just because of those issues right here. Like, you can persuade anyone. Yeah, OK. First off, but yeah, like democracy is a sloppy, chaotic, and um, unstable form of government, right? Uh, irrational form of government. Right, because the masses can be so easily swayed by a persuasive speaker, right? What else do we remember about Plato's beliefs? Not about rhetoric, but about the nature of reality itself. Think back to that allegory of the cave that we talked about. Um, reality is only what you, like, you grow up with, basically. Like, well, is, is, yeah, well, well, is what you see, are the shadows on the back of the cave that you grow up seeing actually reality? Mm -hmm. well, they're, yeah. pardon? Well, yeah, because they're people. Mm -hmm. But all you're seeing is, like all you're sensing is these images, right? Mm -hmm. That are created by shadows behind you. So you're not seeing the real thing. So false versus true. Yeah, and false for Plato is kind of the world of the senses, right? That what we would consider like, you know, the, you know, the real world of experience. Plato uh, considers a pale imitation of a higher world of ideas, right? Mm -hmm. So for Plato, things are pale imitations of ideas. Okay. 
And this goes even for you know, things like um, what we would now consider academic fields, right? Or you know, you know, fields of human endeavor. So um, rhetoric is a false imitation of philosophy, right? All right, philosophy for Plato is the pursuit of truth. And then th thus this is real. Well, rhetoric right, only creates belief or opinion and is thus false, or it's a counterfeit. So where, based on your reading, did Aristotle fall between these two? Does he seem to agree with either Plato or Gorgias? He's like in the middle. OK, uh, why would you say he's in the middle? I mean, he followed, like, he followed Plato, but he also believes in like, um, the surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's not entirely on either of their sides, right? Yeah, he's in the middle. But he does at least seem to believe that rhetoric has some purpose or usefulness. Mm -hmm. yeah. Though a lot of what he's trying to do in this essay is kind of narrow and whittle down that purpose, right, from the very broad claims that Gorgias made for it. So just to tell you a little bit about Aristotle, right? So Aristotle... is born and raised in Greece in the fourth century BCE. Um, Plato was old enough to have some memory of Greek democracy. Um, Aristotle really doesn't. By the time Aristotle uh, reaches adulthood, um, Greece, uh, Athens has been ruled either by Spartan dictators or by Macedonian kings uh, for some time, right? So he's not dealing with a situation where democracy is anything but um, a relic of the past. He is the founder of a school of philosophers called the Peripatetics. So peripatetic comes from a Greek word that means walking around. And this word doesn't really have anything so much to do with their beliefs as with like the way that they used to meet. Because Aristotle wasn't a, a citizen of Athens. Um, his school had to meet on public property. So um, you know, they met, he, he couldn't own property. So they met and walked around together in the public roadways. Hence peripatetic. So here's what they believed, right? So from Plato, the idea comes first, and the thing is just an imitation of it, right? So Plato places what we call a universal, that is a kind of general category or general idea, over Right, now ideas are universals. Things are particulars. And particulars are specific examples. So Plato thinks that all particulars are imitations of universals, right? All specific things are imitations of general ideas. Aristotle flips this around. Aristotle says that you can't understand a universal, you can't form a general category unless you know what belongs in that category. Right? So you have to study the particulars first in order to come up with a universal principle. So for Aristotle, right, things 
or particulars come before ideas or universals. So Aristotle and the Peripatetics are really into describing the features of particular things and using that, to like the, using similarities and difference to put these things into categories, right? Which is one of the reasons why Aristotle can be so bloody boring to read. Now, <clears throat> in addition to this, Aristotle and the Peripatetics believe that matter, that is a kind of general physical substance, is the basis of all existence, and that human beings are endowed with reason. which allows us to convert our sense impressions into knowledge. Now, what was Plato's attitude towards knowledge? Did Plato think that knowledge came from our sense impressions? He did not, yes. <laughs> Good guess, yeah. Plato did not think that knowledge came from our, our sense impressions. Right? For Plato, knowledge is something that is independent of our likes or dislikes or of our fallible senses. It's something kind of above and beyond what human beings uh, can actually reasonably perceive, right? It's some, something that's objectively true in and of itself. Aristotle believes that we actually do form knowledge through our experience with things, right? And that this knowledge can thus be either true or false. Right? Plato did not concede the possibility of there being false knowledge, right? Okay, yeah. If you wanted like that, I wouldn't have <laughs> Yeah. For Plato, like knowledge is always that which is true, right? You can only know things that are true. For Aristotle, on the other hand, knowledge is sometimes false because our sense impressions are sometimes false, right? But we do have this particular faculty of reason that allows us to take particulars, lump them together into universal categories, right? Okay, so these are basic notions that are sort of like Aristotle's core assumptions here, right? So let's then start looking at the essay itself um, and just try to break down some of this naughty language, right? Naughty, K-N-O-T-T-Y, not N-A-U-G-H-T-Y. Right, there's not a lot of profanity here. Um, okay, can I get somebody to read for us the first paragraph on page 133? Accordingly, all men may thus use more or less of both. For to a certain extent, all men attempt to discuss statements and to maintain them, to defend themselves, and to attack others. Ordinary people do this either at random or through practice and from acquired habit. Both ways being possible, the subject can plainly be handled systematically for it is possible to inquire the reason why some speakers succeed through practice and others spontaneously. And everyone will at once agree that such an inquiry is the function of an art. Okay, thank you. So, does everyone understand what dialectic is, or at least the way Aristotle and Plato both use this word? Like speaking, like 
Yeah, conversation, right? So the mod, the, that dialogue model that Plato uses, right, is what is called dialectic. So yeah, dialectic is conversation and questioning. that is supposed to lead the conversance to philosophical truth. Right? The idea being, okay, if we just sit here and keep asking each other questions, right? Eventually we will hit upon the truth that we're looking for. Is rhetoric the way Plato and Aristotle seem to imagine it, dependent on conversation. Does someone like Borgias try to persuade people generally through conversation? Uh, yes. No. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, so. <laughs> okay, so, so a rhetorician, right, affects persuasion through speech but not necessarily through like a multiple-sided conversation, right? A rhetorician gives a speech, right? A rhetor for, you know, rhetoric is much more one-sided, right? Even if we're looking at like a classical debate model, our participants in a debate, and you know, again, like keep our current politics out of this idea, right? Our participants, our participants in a debate supposed to be allowed to interrupt each other. No. They are not supposed to be, right? Okay. But they do all the damn time. <laughs> because nobody can just take a minute to shut up and listen, right? <laughs> but yeah, <clears throat> the way formal debate is supposed to work is that one person says their piece, the other disputant says their piece, right? I mean, you know, think about this as like formal arguments in a court of law, right? The defense attorney is not allowed to interrupt the prosecutor during his opening and closing statement, right? And the prosecutor is not allowed to interrupt the defense attorney during her opening and closing statement, right? They can object to uh, questions that they ask witnesses, but they're not allowed to interrupt those formal parts of, um, of presentation. So rhetoric tends to be a kind of one-sided thing, right? Now, Plato clearly thinks one of these is better than the other, right? Mm -hmm. The dialectic is the real thing, that this is truth. And that rhetoric Is falsehood. Does Aristotle, Aristotle does not seem to agree with this, right? Mm -hmm. What does he call, or how does he define the relationship between these two things? Like they combine. Yeah. Yeah, the word he uses is counterpart, right? Not counterfeit. Right, when we talk about counterparts, right, we're talking about, say, like, you know, parts of a whole that can be, ex you can be exchanged for one another, right, or that, you know, work in tandem with each other, right? Mm -hmm. And how is he pointing it, like, so he spends most of the paragraph here pointing out the ways in which these two things are alike, right? Plato was really focused on the differences between dialectic and rhetoric. According to Aristotle, how are rhetoric and dialectic alike? What do they have in common? Okay. Yeah. So, so part of what he's saying is that everybody uses these 
even if they don't know what they're doing, right? Even if they have no formal training or education in either of these fields, like everybody does this, right? Everybody makes propositions and defends them, whether through conversation or through formal one-sided speech and writing, right? So because everybody has to do this, so because everybody does this anyway, right? It's worth focusing on why this works better when some people do it and not when other people do it, right? What is it that, it's worth studying what makes someone a skilled disputant. All right, so can I get somebody to start reading for us the second very dry paragraph here? Starting with now the framers of the current treatises. And pay close attention here to uh, the, analogies, the analogies that he uses, right? There's one, important, one actually very important metaphor in here. Yeah, go ahead, Elizabeth. Thank you. Now the framers of the current treatises mm -hmm. or rhetoric have constructed but a small portion of the art. The modes of persuasion are the only true con cons constituents. constituents of the art. Everything else is merely accessory. These writers, however, say nothing about enthemies. Enthemies, yep. Enthemies, which are the substance of which Oracle persuasion, but deal mainly with non-essentials. The arousing of prejudice, pity, anger, and similar emotions has nothing, nothing to do with the essential facts, but is merely a personal appeal to the man who is judging the case. Consequently, if the rules for trial, which are now laid in some state, especially in well-governed states, were applied everywhere, such people would have nothing to say. All men, no doubt, think that the law should prescribe such rules, but some, as in the court of Areopagus? Close enough. What is it? Uh, Areopagus. Ah! <laughs> give practical effect to their thoughts and forbid talk about non-essentials. This is sound law and custom. It is not right to pervert the judge by moving him to anger and be or One might as well work a carpenter's rule, rule for these men. Again, a has clearly nothing to do but to show that the alleged fact is so or it is not so. That it has or has not happened. As to whether a thing is important or unimportant, just or unjust, the judge must surely refuse to take his instructions from the litigants. He must decide for himself all such points as a lawgiver has not already defined for him. Okay, thank you. So are there any words that jump out at you in this? The area of famous words. Okay, Areopagus. Litigants. Okay, litigants. 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 Litigants
that that's not one of the functions of rhetoric anyway. It's not the litigant's job to teach the judge what's just or unjust, right? Where should the judge be getting his, his or her, well, I guess in an ancient Greek society, his ideas of what is just and unjust? The evidence and like the stuff that's presented to them. Okay, yeah, the stuff that's presented, like essentially all the, all the judge needs to determine, right, based on the litigants' arguments, or all the litigants need to prove to the judge, is that something did or didn't happen, right? Justice, like what's just or unjust, you know, in terms of punishments, in terms of, um, you know, whether to acquit someone or not, right? That's left in the hands of the judge. And so where is the judge supposed to get his ideas of justice? Let's look at it this way. Like, what does Aristotle seem to argue that teachers of rhetoric like Gorgias focus on? And why is it a problem? What are the non essentials? that teachers of rhetoric like Gorgias care about? The arousing of prejudice, pity, anger, and similar emotions has nothing to do with the essential facts of the case, but is merely a personal appeal to the man who is judging the case. So what is Aristotle arguing the litigants in a legal case shouldn't be trying to do? Like, like I said, like pity and anger. Like, I, I know a lot of court cases are like, oh, he did this, and this person, mm -hmm. how they can feel bad, or they try to get him bad. Right. Mm -hmm. so, or, yeah, like, you know, the, the prosecution might try to scare the jury, right? Yeah. The defense might try to, you know, make the jury feel bad for the defendant, right? So both sides may you know, engage in some kind of emotional manipulation. But does Aristotle seem to think emotional manipulation has any place in a court of law? No, all the litigants are supposed to do is establish the facts, right? This happened or it didn't happen, right? Emotional appeals meant to influence a particular person are out of bounds for him, right? In fact, you know, the, the word he uses to describe this practice is, right, it is not right to pervert the judge by moving him to anger or envy or pity, right? What does it mean to, what, what does it mean to pervert or if something has been perverted? Affected. It's stronger than that though, right? Something can be affected in positive or negative ways, right? Do we ever regard it as positive to pervert something? No, not. Yeah, to pervert means something more like to corrupt, right? That playing on the judge's emotions, right, trying to emotionally influence the judge is to corrupt the judge. One might as well warp a carpenter's rule before using it. What's the point of this analogy? What's a carpenter's rule? Just in a general sense. I know that's extremely distracting. They were doing that this morning at 10 o'clock. Uh huh. Well, you know, all last semester they were sawing and drilling and <laughs> making all that noise building that elevator, so. Look, I had the leaf, I was like, oh, and I looked at it, I was like, I was like, please stop. <laughs> but yeah, getting, getting again, like, back into the, the world of manual labor here, right, as it relates to rhetoric. What's a carpenter's role? What do you use it for? 
Is it like a ruler? Stuff is even? Yeah, it's a yeah, it's a measuring tool. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, yeah, they, 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 no, I was not, I was like, I don't know what it is. Is it a ruler? But Evan said that like the thing that has like the, the ring thing yeah. to see this level. I don't know. I, I just call it a level. <laughs> I didn't know how to name it actually. I don't even know what I call it. Just like that thing, the levels things. Yeah, I think we have, what you're talking about specifically is a spirit level. And I don't think that um, those things would have been, uh, in, th th that had been invented yet in Aristotle's time. But yeah, but they, they would have a, like a similar measuring tool for making sure things were straight, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you're old, you're old. Yeah. So one might as well warp a carpenter's rule before using it. So in comparing a judge to a carpenter's rule, what is Aristotle suggesting he thinks the function of a judge should be? Straight line. Yeah. Yeah, a standard for measurement, right? This is how we draw a straight line. This is how we make things sure things are straight and even and fair, right? Mm -hmm. And if you warp a carpenter's rule, it's no good, right? Mm -hmm. Just as if you warp a judge or prefer a judge with emotional appeals, then the judge is no longer any good. So can I get somebody to continue here for us with now it is a great moment that well-drawn laws. Yeah, go ahead, Ryan. Now it, now it is a great moment of moment that well-drawn laws should themselves define all the points they possibly can and believe as few as may be to the decision of the judges, and this for several reasons. First, to find one man or a few men who are a sensible person and capable of legislating in the mainstream just as a danger than to find a large number. Next, laws are made after long consideration, whereas decisions in the court are given at short notice, which makes it hard for those who try the case to satisfy the claims of justice and expediency. Mm -hmm. The latest reasons of all is that the decision of the law giver is not particular, but pros pros Perspective in general, whereas members of the assembly and the jury find it in their their duty to decide on the definite case brought before them. They will often have allowed themselves to be much influenced by feelings of friendship or hatred or self-interest, that they lose any clear vision of the truth and have their judgment obscured by the consideration of both personal pleasure or pain. In general, then, the judge should, we say, be allowed to decide as few things as possible. Okay, let's pause there for a second. Thank you, Ron. Um, I want to go back to this distinction that Aristotle seems to be making between a well-drawn law and a poorly drawn law. Now, based on what Ron has just read here, what does a well-drawn law seem to look like according to Aristotle? Mm -hmm. The judges will have a hard time in deciding on the... Exactly, yeah. The less left up to the judge's personal interpretation, the better, right? So a well-drawn law for Aristotle is a law in which it's clear and obvious what the law actually states, right? Yeah, there's no gray area. Yeah, so I'm going to give you an example here. I'm going to take two um, amendments from the law. And I want to preface this by saying, you know, put aside for a second any feelings that you have about what either particular amendment means, right? And we just want to think about which, which of these two laws Aristotle would think is well drawn and which he would think is poorly drawn and why. Again, without, you know, thinking about the value of either 
<clears throat> principle here. And we wait and we wait. At least one of these you will probably recognize because it's one of the most frequently talked about amendments. The other may not be entirely familiar to you because we don't talk about it much. So first we have the second amendment, right? A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And then right below it here, we have the Third Amendment. No soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Which of these laws would Aristotle think is better drawn and why? The Third Amendment. Why? Because it's more specific of what's going on. Yeah. The Second Amendment, the Second Amendment, like what is being regulated, like what is considered regulated militia. As for the third one, it's like at a mm -hmm. time of peace, you know what time of peace it is, and then it's like you have to have the law so that you can say that all about the okay. Yeah, well, the third amendment, it's absolutely clear what it allows and what it bans, right? Mm -hmm. The second amendment is a little bit more confusing, which is one of the reasons why we continually debate it, right? That it's open to different possible interpretations, depending on how you read this first clause, right? Does the law say that the right of the people to keep and bear arms is dependent on there being a well-regulated militia? And is the Second Amendment thus irrelevant to a society which, is, you know, which has a standing army? Or is the only meaningful part of the sentence the second clause, right? The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So again, like without taking any position on this, look, like I know, like I'm a long-haired, beardy dude. Uh, with a PhD from the Northeast um, who doesn't wear suits and uh, teaches poetry for a living, right? So it's probably not that hard to suss out how I vote, right? But, <clears throat> you know, the only point I'm trying to make here, right, is that this law is left open to, interpreta to ju judicial interpretation and has been interpreted differently by judges throughout American history, right? So because of that, Aristotle would regard this as a poorly drawn law. Whether it's a just or unjust law, right, he would regard this as being too open to interpretation. Whereas this law, yeah, okay, you can't put soldiers in people's houses without their permission. Okay. So <clears throat> Aristotle seems particularly interesting in having like clear standards, right, for measuring things. And how do we get those standards? Why does he think laws are more important than decisions in a court? Laws are made after long consideration. Okay. Like courts give decisions at a short notice. Yeah, so one, one difference here is that laws are subject to a long process of debate and deliberation, right? They're not made in the heat of the moment, whereas court decisions are made much more swiftly, right? And based on a particular case. So we have, again, like this whole thing about general principles versus particular cases, right? And what a law does is spell out a general principle that's supposed to be applicable to all particular cases, right? Which actually runs kind of counter to what Aristotle usually seems to believe in. Now, he mentioned enthymemes on the first page as well. Does everybody understand what an enthymeme is? Does anybody understand what an enthymeme is? Isn't it like, a, like having an argument without showing any expression? Um, it's not so much that you don't have it. Like it is actually having like having something to argue, right? A 
thesis yeah, something like a thesis statement, right? Although what Aristotle means is actually a little bit more specific. Uh, so do any of you know what a syllogism is? Okay, it's on your list to look up, yeah. <laughs> okay, so a syllogism um, is uh, a way to test the logic of a particular proposition, right? So you start with a general principle, right? All human beings are mortal. Then you apply a specific case to that general principle. Socrates is human. Thus, we conclude. I think I said like deductive reasoning. Um, uh huh. Yeah, it's a form of deductive reasoning. Exactly. Yeah, you start with with a general idea, you apply a specific case to it, and you reach a conclusion based on that, right? Um, so all a syllogism actually does is test whether or not a, a proposition is logical, not whether it's truthful. Right. So if I were to say, for example, right, all fish can fly. Steve is a fish. Therefore, Steve can fly. It's logical, but it's not true, right? Yeah. They can fly. They can't, like, fly <laughs> okay. bird. Well, and to be fair, flying fish can actually really only glide. <laughs> so, but, you know, the point I'm trying to make here is, again, like, as per Aristotle's arguments, right, reason doesn't always produce knowledge that is true, right? Logic doesn't always lead us to truth. Now, an enthymeme is basically just a syllogism with one of the premises removed, right? So there's an implied premise. Uh, a good example is there was a, a commercial from uh, the 90s, I think. Um, it went something like this. A bigger burger is a better burger. The burgers are bigger at Burger King. So what's the implied premise that's left out? Burger King's burgers are better than some places. Yeah, it leaves out the conclusion, right? Mm -hmm. It leaves you to draw the conclusion for yourself, right? A bigger burger is a better burger. The burgers are bigger at Burger King. Hence, the burgers are better at Burger King, right? So a syllogism is, yeah, for, or not a syllogism, an enthymeme is for our Aristotle, kind of like the basic unit you build a rhetorical argument around. And he says that the sophists don't pay attention to these reasonable appeals. Rather, what they're concerned with is manipulating people's emotions. And that that is not the proper use of rhetoric. So let's go to what Aristotle thinks are good uses of rhetoric. If we look towards the second part of this that you guys uh, felt a little more confident with. Um, we talked about those three modes of persuasion, those three appeals last time, right? Ethos, pathos, logos. Which of these does Aristotle seem to regard as most important and why? Pardon? He said um, persuasion is achieved by the speaker's personal character. Is that um, paper? Is it? Is it paper? Yeah. I always get on these things. Yeah, and it, it, it's, you know, they, they all sound very similar. All these os words, right? But I know ethos is like ethics. Yeah, so. Character ethics, right? Yeah. So connect those things together. So yeah, the speaker's character 
is what he regards as most important. How can we tell that he regards the speaker's character as the most important element of persuasion? He says it makes us think he's credible. Like makes us think that he's telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We are more likely to believe a speaker who seems credible to us, right? Yeah. His character, at the top of page 137, may almost be called the most effective means of persuasion he possesses. So proving that you're a person of good character is the most effective mode of persuasion for Aristotle, right? Mm -hmm. That has to come first. And there's actually a, like contemporary research that bears this out, right? So like um, when psychologists look at uh, attempts to convince people to adopt uh, say, different political opinions or you know, different sets of beliefs. How effective do you think throwing facts at them is? Not very effective. Usually not very effective, yeah. It rarely moves the needle at all. And this is something that Aristotle seems to recognize, right? What does he seem to regard as actually the least important part of making an argument? Logos. Yeah. Logos comes last. Establishing the facts comes last. Because people aren't going to listen to you if they don't already think you're a person of good character, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what does he have to say about pathos? Yeah, and you need to make sure that you're putting them in a receptive frame of mind, right? Does this seem quite, does this seem similar at all to what he was saying about perverting the judge's ruling? A little bit, right? Yeah, you're getting into slightly dodgy territory here, making the judge more receptive through emotional appeals, right? But does he seem to be talking about this, like, does he seem to be talking about the same thing here? Yeah, it's like they're on the same basis. Yeah. And I think like this is one of the problems I have with it, with this is that he doesn't quite see like it's not always clear where he's making some of the, he's making distinction after distinction after distinction, right? Yeah. But it's not always clear where he's dividing some of these things up. I think it might help if we look back on page 134. The paragraph that starts with, hence it comes that, although the same systematic principles apply. Can I get somebody to read that for us? And I know that it is hot and uncomfortable in here and it's probably making people sleepy. Mm -hmm. Hence it comes Thank that you, all those the same systematic principles apply to political as to forensic oratory. Mm -hmm. And although the former is a nobler business and better for a citizen than that which concerns the relations of private individuals. These authors say nothing about political oratory, but try one and all to write treatises on the way to plead in court. Okay, so stop there for a second, right? And let's kind of just let's look at this together for a minute and think about what binaries Aristotle is building here in these couple of sentences, right? What things is he comparing to each other? Forensic, oratory, and political. Okay, forensic and political is first, right? Good. What is, and what is forensic oratory? Arguments designed to establish facts from the past, especially as they relate to guilt or innocence in the criminal trial. Yeah, when we talk about forensics, we're talking about evidence in court, right? This is still the case. Right, you know, what, what, like, what does a forensic scientist do? You guys know? 
they found evidence like that. So. Yeah, yeah. So, so they, you know, they they conduct autopsies, right? You know, they, you know, check, you know, uh, you know, check for you know handgun residue and things like that. You know, they, they check the trajectory of bullets, things like that, right? Things to establish innocence or guilt in a court of law, right? DNA evidence, things like that. So then what is political rhetoric? And how is that different from forensic rhetoric? Um, isn't it like forensic rhetoric is like how we feel about something? Your beliefs? Um, or like, it could be like laws thing? Yeah, I, I think that we're, we're talking again about this difference between the particular and the general, right? That the forensic applies to particular legal cases, right? Mm -hmm. Establishing what did or didn't happen in a specific time and place to specific people. So it's kind of like a courtroom and then just like a supreme courtroom. Yeah, or I think maybe think of it more like, like a courtroom versus a legislative chamber, right? Mm -hmm. So political oratory would be more about moving people to make particular laws. And forensic oratory would be more about applying the law in particular cases, right? Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay. So what other binaries are implied in this then? What does he mean, for example, when he says the political oratory is fitter for a citizen. Because like since it's general, you have to make a decision as for like forensic is mainly based on like the scientific facts. Uh-huh. Well, I think what we might want to think about is what a citizen is, right? What's the difference between your role as a citizen and your role as a private individual? Yeah, thank you, John F. Kennedy. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, a citizen is sort of like what we are in our role, in our public role, our public lives, right? A citizen is a public identity. Whereas forensic oratory applies to private individuals, right? So there's a public private binary here as well which kind of fits into this general um, universal specific pattern, right? This general universal specific dichotomy. Okay, so the reason for this in the political oratory, there's less inducement to talk about non-essentials. Political oratory is less given to unscrupulous practices than forensic. That, you know, that was a little bit of an eye opener for me. Because it treats of wider issues. In political debate, the man who is forming a judgment is making a decision about his own vital interests. There is no need, therefore, to prove anything except that the facts are what the supporter of a measure maintains they are. In forensic oratory, this is not enough. To conciliate the listener is what pays here. It is other people's affairs that are to be decided, so that the judges, intent on their own satisfaction in listening with partiality, surrender themselves to the disputants instead of judging between them. Hence, in many places, as we have said already, irrelevant speaking is forbidden in the law courts. In the public assembly, those who have to form a judgment are themselves well able to guard against that. So what's his big argument then for the superiority of political oratory over forensic oratory? Which, is, which does he think is more susceptible to corruption and shoddy practices and misinterpretation? Yeah, and why is that? Why does he think forensic oratory is is more corruptible? Jesus Christ. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and more importantly, you can tamper with the emotions of the people hearing the case, right? As as we've already established here. So, what does he argue makes political rhetoric different? Then, how is political rhetoric? less corruptible. 
it's because it's the whole, it's not just one or two people, it's like a whole movie slash. Like okay, yeah, it, it's, it's a larger group of people making the decision together, right? And weirdly, what makes them less corruptible is that, as he says, like, in a political debate, the man who is forming a judgment is making a decision about his own vital interests, right? In a political debate, right, you're listening to the candidates, or you're listening to the different proposals, and you're thinking about what's good for you before you make a decision about who to back, right? What <clears throat> happens in a court of law, right, for the judge and the jury, um, does what happens to the defendant really affect them in any particular way? No. Not really, right? They're, not, they're, they're making a judgment about someone else's interests rather than their own. And so, Aristotle argues, they are thus more susceptible to corruption because it doesn't matter to them what the outcome of the case is. Um, and sitting on a jury is something that most of you will probably have to do at some point in your lives. Um, so look forward to that. Does, does, he, does he go and act crazy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my, my, my wife gets called up whenever she's eligible and um, always gets picked. For juries, um, she like I've actually I've actually never been called up, which you know I, 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 you know I'm I'm going to be 43 in March and you know to have never been called <laughs> up for jury duty is actually a like I, I feel like I've had a pretty good run here. You know? is, okay, so I think if we want to break this down into the usual formula, the you know seems to be about X, but could also be about Y. Right? I think there are a couple of things we could, we could say about this, right? That this seems to be about rhetoric. Right? But could also be about law, right? Implied uh, themes that we pulled out of this, right? What else could this possibly be about, apart from just being a description of rhetoric? Just given what we've talked about today. It's, it's hard to think when they're doing that, yes. So it seems to be about rhetoric, it could also be about law. Right? Could also be about justice, right? Yeah. Which is not necessarily the same thing as law. What else? You think about some of these strands and binaries that we pulled out of this. Truth. Yeah, it could also be about truth. It's good. Could you say personal gain? Okay, yeah. There's certainly um, an attitude here towards personal gain, right? That is expressed. Could also be about private versus public, right? Mm -hmm. Particular versus general. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, universal versus particular. Good. So, if you were to have to write about this, 
what you would want to do is pick one of these other themes or binaries, right, that's lying under the surface of the text. You'd want to pull that out and bring it up to the surface and make an argument, not just that it's there, right, but also why it matters and how it affects the way we should read this. So we're going to be getting some practice with that over the next couple of sessions. But remember, yeah, for next time, you're just reading uh, the passage from the Aeschylus play of uh, the Amenities. Anybody have any questions about anything before I let you go? Everybody is just kind of ready to go and start the weekend and not have to listen to that in the back anymore. <laughs> All right, uh, great. So we'll see you Tuesday.